Good evening, and welcome to Conversations with Commissioner. Uh, I am Luke Hattelstad. I am the Public Information Officer for Arapahoe County, and we are hosting this virtual public event. Uh, this is our third of five that are, that are happening this month and into next month. And these are the events that you may have attended in person in the past. The, the conversation events are meant to, uh, to get you to let you let you get to know your commissioner a little bit better. Go ahead, commissioner. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm so glad everyone could be here tonight. I'm Jeff Baker, Arapahoe County Commissioner for District 3. Um, glad to see. I, I don't see everybody, but I miss seeing everyone. And um, this is the best way for us to get together now and for me to answer any questions that may be on your mind. So I'd like to see if there are um, uh, any folks out there that would like to introduce themselves. I'm not hearing anything, but... I'm joined tonight by Shannon Carter, our Director of Open Spaces and Intergovernmental uh, um, Relations. And so, again, I'll give a little bit of time for anyone that wants to introduce themselves. All right, I'll have other opportunities for introductions later on. Um, this is one of the ways that the county commissioners can engage with the citizens of the county. We have the conversations with the commissioner um, spaced out throughout the year. We've done in-person town hall meetings, and I, my goal was to try to do at least four a year, one every quarter. But my fellow commissioners and I are very interested in hearing from all of you. We want to know what your hopes are, the dreams are for the county, as well as those things that cause you concern. We're always looking for different ways for you to engage with us. This is the quarterly uh, conversation with the commissioner for specifically my district, District 3. These are smaller, more intimate events where we can have a conversation about what's happening in the county and specifically in my district. We also have a number of telephone town halls where you can call in and engage in any number of different topics. We've held 10 of those since the COVID outbreak began and we'll continue to do those regularly for the time being. We've also increased the frequency of commissioner newsletters, the county line news. Um, that has moved from being a monthly to a weekly since the pandemic began. And you can sign up to receive that by visiting our website at www.arapahogov.com. This has been a very unusual year, um, but how the, the county continues to run, the business of the county continues, and we are continuing to serve our constituents, serve our citizens. This has been uh, such a busy year because of the added um, requirements that the Board of County Commissioners has had dealing with the COVID crisis. There are a number of big projects that are ongoing despite COVID and some that uh, we may have more projects. I'd like to give you an overview of some of these items today, but I also want to hear from you. So I may break off and let Luke explain how to um, um, speak to me and get your, um, your uh, tell me what's on your mind. One of the first things that we've got is a number of elections. We have one more election coming up in 2020. Thank you, Luke, for changing the slide for me. I appreciate that. I know I forgot to say next slide. But uh, we have the general election coming up on November 3rd. I want to say that um, I heard from the clerk and recorder's office today that the um, election judges that they're trying to hire, um, they have 
um, they have a certain requirement that a certain number from each party, a certain number of Democrats, a certain number of Republicans, and a certain number of unaffiliated. They're filled with um, Democrat election judges. They have enough uh, uh, Democrats uh, for the election judges, but they still need 25 to 30 more Republican election judges. So I'll just throw that out there that if you're a Republican and would like to become an election judge, please go to the county's website, look for the clerk and recorders, pull down menu and uh, elections, and they'll tell you how you can get hired as an election judge. We've already had the June 30th primary. It was a record setting turnout for a primary and we're anticipating even higher interest in the election on November 3rd. We're committed to a good process and increasing communication with voters, making it easy for people to vote and to get their vote counted safely and securely. Um, we'd likely to see a lot more mail-in ballots, but I would remind folks that there are lots of drop-off boxes. And if you wanna see where those drop-off boxes are, you can again, go to the county's website under the clerk and recorder pull-down menu and see where those are um, located. So you can save a stamp or two, depending on the, the weight of the ballot and get those uh, votes in. The motor vehicle and recording offices are um, um, increased online services. Uh, right now, they're only doing transactions uh, by appointment only. Uh, we're not able to have all of our staff um, working in working because of the space requirements to distance. And uh, transactions that require payments and receipts, our staff have to use the state's computer system. So just as a little bit of information, we're currently serving between 60 to 70% of the pre-COVID customer service numbers. Approximately 1,000 people a day are having their motor vehicle and uh, recording um, needs met by our office. Uh, all of the drop boxes I've got a note here that says that uh, to facilitate contactless service uh, for safer voting and exploring making payment via phone, uh, something permanent. So we're learning from this COVID experience. We're learning that we may uh, be able to use technology a lot quicker. It's kind of forced us to move faster into the technology, including recording. We're um, assessing opportunities to digitize uh, records to help increase online public access and reduce the need for in-person visits. Next slide, please, Lou. The census this year is very important to Arapahoe County. I know there are some folks who, who distrust government. I know there are folks who um, may not be comfortable with providing the information that the census provide, uh, asks you for. It's very important for everyone in Arapahoe County to be counted. No matter where you are in Arapahoe County, whether you're living in uh, your parents' basement, whether you're renting, whether you own your own home, whether you're in transition between one place or another, it's important for you to be counted. So much goes into um, the results that, that we get, the data from the data that the census collects. It's drawing to a close fairly soon. This is required by law every 10 years. The census data helps us to determine congressional seats and Colorado is poised to pick up one, at least one, maybe more congressional seats. It also directly impacts funding for many of our services, such as economic development, housing assistance, transportation improvements, and other critical services, such as those provided by human services to help us protect our most vulnerable citizens, the very, very old and the very, very young. Our service area includes 
many diverse populations and geographical uh, considerations that pose unique challenges to getting an accurate count. So it's very important for everyone on this, this uh, chat um, in the county to be counted and participate. If you haven't already submitted your census survey, you still may get visited by someone at your home. Someone may come and knock on your door. So in order to reduce that, go online or find out how you can do it by phone and that will help um, prevent the need to have somebody come knock at your door. Next slide, please. And for this, I'm going to introduce our uh, Director of Open Spaces, Shannon Carter. Shannon, would you please talk to the folks about your program? Okay, well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, parks, trails, and open spaces, which is uh, something that's uh, very popular these days, especially in the era of stay at home or safer at home. Many people have uh, taken full advantage of the parks, trails, and open spaces that are an integral part of our community. And so all of that is uh, funded, no matter whether you live in a city or a town or a special district, all of it contributes or all of them are benefiting from the quarter cent sales and use tax that was put in place in uh, 2003. Uh, the program kind of got started in 2004, and that's a quarter of a cent uh, which basically translates to um, was it ten dollars for every a hundred dollars or a quarter 25 cents for every hundred dollars and that goes directly to support parks trails and open spaces within Arapahoe county and that tells us a little bit about uh as far as the support from the community because one of the things that uh happens is that uh, back in 2003 it was uh, implemented and it was a 10-year tax and so back in 2011, uh, the voters uh, voted to extend it to 2023. And so the tax does expire in uh, 2023, unless of course the voters decide to extend it even further. And a little bit about that tax, about 62% of the funds are shared back with the municipalities. That is your local cities, towns, and of course your park districts. 50% uh, of it goes directly to the cities, 12% of it goes to the special districts and the cities for special projects. There's a grant program. Uh, as a matter of fact, last year, or actually uh, earlier this year, uh, we awarded almost $4 million for parks and trails and other types of uh, projects within the county. And it goes anywhere from completing a trail network to uh, even there's a, uh, a fishing pond that uh, they're going to be putting out in the, ben in the Bennett area. And of course, uh, we use this strategically to try to complete a number of different uh, projects that are really a benefit to the community. A couple of examples are the E-470 trail. We um, uh, partnered with the Highway Authority to complete the trail from Quincy all the way south to Ireland. And of course, we're going to be going north. Uh, that's under construction. And that will be uh, going all the way up to, e or excuse me, to I-70. Another project that we're really uh, involved in quite a bit is, of course, the Highline Canal, which winds through the metro area about 71 miles from Douglas County all the way up to Adams County. But a good portion of it is within Arapahoe County. And so we fund a number of different uh, projects and, and uh, different improvements along those lines, including the uh, uh, underpasses. Uh, we completed the underpass uh, under um, Iliff Road uh, under construction right now is the two underpasses that will go underneath uh, uh, what is it, uh, Hampton and Colorado Boulevard so that there was a safe passage underneath the road as opposed to basically trying to dodge traffic. Another project that's uh, going to get started fairly soon is the Parker Mississippi underpass. And so a lot of that is used strategically. And that goes to the Open Spaces Master Plan, which is a large project that we're uh, in, engaged in to really look at what the future would need to be as far as how we utilize uh, the open space sales and use tax. We've got a couple of goals that we want to hit. We want to make sure that uh, we're using these funds to make strategic acquisitions 
for preserving parks, trails, and open space in the future. And that not only involves conservation easements, uh, outright fee simple purchases, but also land dedications when developers come in uh, to build subdivisions or commercial property. So we're looking at what those regulations and what those strategic plans should be. Also, one of the things that we find very important, and again, as we highlighted the fact that many people are utilizing our parks and trails, is maintenance. We need to make sure that we're taking care of what we have and that we're really uh, putting our money towards uh, investing not only in the future, but also maintaining and keeping up with what we currently have. Now, as far as how we can uh, benefit from the public input, we've done a number of different surveys. Uh, we've got opportunities on the website to um, put comments towards the, the master plan, as well as uh, other open space activities. One of the other things that's kind of unique about our program is that we have two, two heritage properties. One is the historic 17 Mile House, which some of you may have attended the <laughs> excuse me, the uh, fall festival. And of course, we have the county fairgrounds, which has the county fair. Uh, unfortunately, this year we weren't able to have the fair, but again, those are the types of activities uh, that we support through the Open Spaces program. And one of the questions that came in is from David, and uh, he asked the question that pictures on the plains was a fun event. Are there plans to have or to do more like this at the fairgrounds? Well, David, coincidentally, uh, I just got a proposal from this morning from our fairground staff. They've got a number of different events and activities that they'd like to be able to put on at the fairgrounds. Uh, again, very family friendly events and public events that again, can uh, really bring families together in a social distance way in a way that uh, certainly makes sure that everyone is safe. So look for that. Uh, I think just as a uh, teaser, they're going to have uh, some type of a uh, Halloween event, potentially, um, a Christmas event, uh, something in the spring. And of course, uh, we're looking at activating a number of different events around our trail network. So we'll be having a number of different events and activities, not only at the fairgrounds, but also throughout our open spaces uh, uh, that we have. And of course, it's going to be in partnership with uh, some of the special districts and cities and towns. So hopefully that gives you a broad overview of what we do in regards to our open spaces program. Uh, and again, welcome any questions or comments about our program and what we have planned for the future. questions yet or anyone else that has indicated they want to ask a question yeah uh can you guys hear me yes yes great shannon can you talk a little bit about um how even though we didn't have the fair we were able to do the 4-h event virtually and partially in person yes exactly what we did is um just like i believe i was watching a uh news report about the state fair. What we did is we basically over the, the week of the, that would be traditional fair, we uh, had the species come in every week. And we also were able to have the uh, livestock sale, the junior livestock sale. And we did that virtually. And so we were able to, again, support the 4-H prog programs as well as the completion events. And so they did have the 4-H competition. We had some open class as well as some of the other events and activities that are really associated with the 4-H uh, program. It was very well attended, uh, very successful. And so certainly I think we, hopefully we set a model for uh, the state fair as well as other fairs around the, uh, uh, county fairs around the front range. Excellent, thank you. And yeah, that was really a great thing to be able to do for those kids that you know spent all year working with those animals and stuff. So that was really tr tremendous for us. All right, back to Commissioner Baker. Thank you, Luke. Yes, um, so we have the open space master plan going on. We also have another master plan, the transportation master plan going on. Now, these sorts of things where we look at 
people may not realize transportation is the word that government uses for roads and bridges. It can include uh, multimodal transportation and public transportation, such as that provided by the regional transportation district. So transportation has a much broader um, definition in government besides just filling potholes or in making roads wider and things like that. We do have a transportation master plan going on. Um, these are hot topics. This is something that is uh, near and dear to me. Uh, we're inviting county residents to participate in this event, um, in this planning process. It is, uh, we're going to have a lot of ways to uh, comment interactive with maps and understanding uh, what is going on in your particular neck of the woods. So we're also engaging cities to find out how we can fund these local priorities giving, given the statewide uh, efforts have failed in the past few years to raise money for that. This um, is, everything can be found at www.arapahogov.com slash transportation plan. And there's the, um, the link there. So please take a picture of that or um, um, screen print, whatever you can do if you want to go try to find that uh, information and want to participate. Uh, Arapahoe County, next slide please. The um, Arapahoe County Public Airport Authority. Um, I sit on the board of the Public Airport Authority. Um, can I get the next slide please? It's about, I'm sorry, back one. Metroplex, I was thinking. There's a little delay between what I'm seeing. So the Metroplex. Uh, we're working with the FAA on some changes that they've made to uh, how traffic is routed into Denver International Airport and also uh, how that affects Centennial Airport. We have a lot more people that are impacted by the noise at Centennial Airport. Um, we do have a noise roundtable that people can participate in and call in uh, to ask questions. But the Metroplex project from the FAA with DIA as its, its uh, target has created some additional um, concerns about noise. So that's one of the things I'm doing. Next slide. Have to talk a little bit about the COVID-19 crisis. This shutdown, of course, began in March. Most county staff began working remotely at that time. We're gradually bringing people back. Uh, but we have to comply with the governor's orders for safe distancing and mask wearing. And we also have to keep our employees and the, and the public safe when they come and, and, and get business done at our county facilities. We've slowly begun to reopen and in-person services are mostly by appointment only now. We still have a lot of work that we have to do. We've been working very closely with Tri-County Health Department to try and uh, and the other counties in, in Tri-County Health Department, Adams County and Douglas County, on a lot of the um, orders that have come from the governor. Um, the county did submit before the, the state uh, stopped accepting variance requests. We were able to get a variance um, from the state's public health orders in late June, but we need to make sure that we keep our case numbers down or risk having those exemptions pulled by the state government. This crisis has introduced a, a need for multiple programs and efforts designed to account for new staffing concerns and altered ways of doing business. Next slide, please. We talked a little bit about the census and how important that is. Here's a little bit of, um, I'm sorry, this isn't the census. This is Arapahoe County Cares. We did receive from the federal government $114.5 million from the Federal Cares Act. Uh, Arapaho Cares is a program that arose from uh, wanting to provide aid to our 
and relief to our citizens and businesses, schools, uh, Economic Security Act that passed this spring. It gave us this money to finance COVID, COVID related relief programs. We're sharing 45% of these funds, about $51.5 million with our 13 communities in Arapahoe County. The amounts are allocated by population size and we're using the rest of the overall amount to fund everything from making our facilities safer to support our residents, particularly the most vulnerable, the very, very old, and uh, maybe people with underlying health conditions. We've already rolled out a number of different programs that we've learned um, from this crisis. We've provided help to 373 county businesses with about $6 million in grants. We've helped 341 households with rent or mortgage assistance. Uh, we recently added another 500,000 to that program. We're doing uh, funding of, for food banks, homelessness uh, centers, uh, mental health, physical and behavioral health, food and housing. We've partnered with Stride and the city of Aurora and Lincoln Health to provide mobile testing for COVID across the county. We're supporting um, their efforts to um, try to put an end to this in Arapahoe County. We've actually even got a early warning uh, system in place, which is kind of funny. It, it looks at sewage water testing and the University of Colorado Health Science Center at Anschutz um, is looking at a study of first responders and community testing. So we're doing an awful lot with COVID. There may be more questions, but I wanna get through these uh, slides um, so that we can move on to questions. Next slide, please. We have uh, the economic and business relief programs. I think I talked about a lot of these. Um, we are working with AD Works. They're hosting regular webinar webinars around hiring, retraining people who may have lost their job because of COVID and uh, wanting to move into a, another field. So uh, we're trying to match those folks with prospective employers. Uh, we also offer uh, rental and mortgage assistance. Uh, you can find more information about this at our website and also at 80works.org for more details. Um, in human services, next slide, please. We're using CARES funds, cr uh, funding to create a hotel motel voucher program uh, for people who are experiencing homelessness as a result of COVID or who need temporary housing because COVID has made it unsafe for them to return home. There may be a, a susceptible person in that home, an elderly person or someone with underlying health conditions that makes someone recovering from COVID unable to go home, even though they don't no longer need to be hospitalized. We established a similar program to provide CARES funding to food banks, Meals on Wheels, uh, organizations affected by the crisis on top of the programs that we already administer. We've used CARES funding to reimburse behavioral, physical health organizations for telehealth, PPE, and sanit uh, sanitization supplies. Uh, we already excel in providing mandated services like food assistance, Medicaid, response to child abuse and neglect reports, but it's been very helpful to have this money from the federal government and such a strong performance heading into a pandemic. Our human services uh, staff are to be commended for their uh, provision of services. They've won numerous awards, including the CSTAT award for um, um, providing exceptional services to our citizens. This is the fourth year in a row that they've received these Distinguished Performance Awards and their measures of overall effectiveness in providing mandated services. We're the only large county that's received it for so many consecutive years. Next slide. Another subject near and dear to my heart is the Arapahoe County Sheriff's Office. For many of you that know me, know that my background is in law enforcement. Uh, 
And so the Arapahoe County Sheriff's Office has just issued their um, uh, 2019 annual report on number of cases and the type of response that they had. I will point out that every year they go through an accreditation process and an inspection from three different agencies that offer accreditation, um, including accreditation of our jail to make sure that they're providing services that meet the state of the art, the best practices in that type of uh, environment. Next slide, please. Now let's talk a little bit about what happens after this. Uh, despite the, the funding, despite how we all may feel and how we've responded to the COVID crisis, the economic effects are going to be uh, effects are going to be long lasting. We know that, and we know that uh, Arapahoe County is no exception to what's going on across the nation. Um, we hope to be able to address these concerns, but our crystal ball is not working uh, really well. No one is sure about what's happening, but we're going through the process to develop our 2020 budget. Um, our property tax revenue growth um, was only 3.2% uh, in 2020 compared to previous years. An example would be 4.6% in 2019 as new in construction and inflation decrease. Our general fund, which is primarily uh, the, the operating fund for the, um, for the county, it's about $200 million out of a total budget of 430 million. Our operating budget was, was we're required to have a structurally balanced um, operating fund, uh, general fund with a small surplus. Um, slower revenue growth limit our ability to increase funding for programs and services. So we've got to tighten our belt. That's, that's the bottom line. In the meantime, um, our expenditures prices continue to grow. The cost of things that we buy, steel, asphalt, um, for our construction projects and our roads uh, continue to go up, as does the cost of labor. These costs continue to grow at a faster rate than our ability to pay for them. So again, we may have to step down and delay some of the projects that Arapahoe County had projected to undertake in 2021. The recent decrease in sales tax revenue, although we only have one sales tax in Arapahoe County, as Shannon explained to you, it's a quarter of 1%. Um, people are not spending as much money. Um, it's more concerning for our city partners uh, than it is for the county, but the economic impacts of COVID-19 uh, um, won't catch up to the county until 2022 because of our focus, our, our main income coming from property taxes. So the county assessors looking at those property taxes um, in, in years when we do those assessments, um, will catch up to us somewhere around 2022. Next slide. Property tax is our largest source of revenue and it continues to be limited by um, different factors, um, including Gallagher and to a certain extent Tabor. I'm an advocate of Tabor, but, and we're one of the, uh, the eight counties in Colorado that still has our property tax, our general fund, uh, subject to Tabor, and uh, we believe that Tabor has done a good job of limiting the growth of government spending in Arapahoe County. We're projecting gaps in funding, though, uh, that may be needed across a number of operating programs and capital project areas. We have a backlog, growing backlog, of deferred maintenance for facilities and for roadways that will continue to grow if we can't find funding for that. Beyond 2021, growth in other operating funds such as human services and the general fund will put a strain on balancing our budget. So we, again, just need to tighten our belt. We don't anticipate receiving any additional funds other than the money we got for um, uh, the CARES funding. And um, 
So it's up to us to increase efficiency. Keep in mind that the county mill levy of 11.684 for 2020 is the lowest in the metro area. Your taxes coming out of your pocket uh, almost certainly went up because the value of your house went up, but the percent, which is the mill levy, has not been raised in, I believe, 19 years. So we have some big decisions. Next slide, please. Tough choices, big decisions, um, things that keep us up at night for me are safety of the roads, safety of our deputies. Um, things like that are very important to me. A um, lot of things that I want to hear about from you. What keeps you up at night? Are there any questions that you would like to ask me? What else do you want to hear about from us? Luke, do we have any questions? Uh, yes, we do. Um, and I want to tell everyone who's listening, um, if you're on the phone and you want to ask a question, you, you should press star three on your phone and you'll be directed to an operator who will then funnel you through to the commissioner and uh, Director Carter. Um, I will start with by jumping back a little bit to the COVID discussion. Can you explain um, the situation with the mask opt out we did in the eastern part of the county? I sure can. Um, Tri-County Health, uh, which we're one of the um, three counties that belong to Tri-County Health. Tri-County Health uh, employs medical experts that make recommendations to the Board of Health on what kind of public health orders to enact. Um, the um, safer at home order by the governor, stay at home order by the governor, who's an elected official. Um, he runs for election every four years. So he's subject to public um, scrutiny. He's subject to people can either vote for him or vote against him because of those decisions that he made. Um, the Tri-County Health Department made a recommendation to the Board of Health that a mask order be optional in Arapahoe County. The Board of Health uh, voted to uh, make it a mandatory mask order in Arapahoe County, in addition to in Adams County, uh, which wanted to have a mandatory mask order, and Douglas County, which did not want to have a mandatory mask order. Um, that, that Board of Health decision came a few days before the governor elected to make a statewide mask order. So at one point, we were going to have two orders in effect, two mask orders, and one from the Tri-County Health and one from the governor. There were differences in those two public health orders. And the Board of County Commissioners, the five of us got together, and I asked the other commissioners to consider opting out of the Tri-County Health Department mask order at the time, mainly because there was already a governor's public health order that took that superseded any public health order from Tri-County Health Department for certain areas. And it was, my recommendation was based on data that I got from Tri-County Health that showed that the Eastern, more rural part of Arapahoe County, the communities of Watkins, Bennett, Byers, Strasburg, and Deer Trail, which had a very low number of cases and even low, lower numbers of hospitalizations, lower numbers of ICU admissions, and lower numbers of deaths reported due to COVID in that area. And the other four county commissioners agreed with me and we voted to opt out of Tri-County Health Department's orders for the area east of Watkins Road. So that made it a little bit less confusing for the folks out there. They didn't have to worry about two different mask orders, although they are required when they come into town and attend um, uh, events or go shopping in Aurora or Adams County or Douglas County, they are then under the governor's uh, mask order. I hope that explains it. it. 
in, in kind of a quick way. That's great, thank you. Um, we, we probably will get a couple other COVID questions um, and we will answer those as well as we can. We, we don't have any public health experts on the call tonight. Um, we will have a COVID specific town hall coming in uh, on September 24th, so a few weeks from now. Um, and we'll do our best to answer any COVID questions you have tonight. Um, and I think uh, one of the, uh, the next question we have here is from Kevin, who's on the phone. And uh, Kevin, you are live. Hopefully. Okay, maybe he's not. Hello. There we go. Hey, Kevin. <laughs> I was just was wondering that uh, I'm the senior. I'm the president of a senior group over there in Strasburg, and uh, we would like to get our meetings going again, our potlucks. But what would be the best way to do that? Would it be everybody bring their own uh, silverware to serve, or uh, does everybody wear uh, uh, gloves or whatever? I think that if you follow, and the best people to ask this question are going to be our Tri-County Health Department partners. There's a lot of information you can glean from their website about different uh, gatherings and how best to do that. But for the most part, um, I'm not sure if they need to bring their own silverware, but um, could you have plastic um, utensils wrapped in plastic that you can get at, uh, you know, a lot of different places. And the people who are serving should be wearing masks and gloves. Um, most serve uh, food wearing gloves anyway, so that's not anything new. It would be the masks that they would be required to wear. But also make sure that you have reservations or that you have RSVPs, you have an idea of how many people are going to be there, and that you keep it under the recommended number based on our current public health order from the governor. And again, you can find that information out on the Tri-County Health Department website. Okay, thank you, yeah. sir. That's great, thank you, Kevin. Um, and, and one of the things we've really been trying to tell people, and we get all kinds of calls and emails and stuff from businesses and houses of worship that, are, that really wanna make sure that we're doing this right. And because of that, we've been fortunate to maintain our variants and um, state we're not at the moment in any severe danger of having anything revoked. So we just urge everyone to keep it up and do all the good work that you've already been doing. So we appreciate that a lot. Um, next question is online, and uh, Edith would like to know if we have any, what's the latest information in regards to the widening of Gun Club Road? Widening of Gun Club Road, that's a topic near and dear to my heart. I, I live probably uh, five minutes away from, from Gun Club Road and Quincy. Of course, let me just explain a little bit about Gun Club Road. Um, Gun Club uh, road is State Highway 30 north of Quincy. So from Quincy to the north, that belongs to the state. That's CDOT's responsibility to maintain and, um, and, and to provide services for. South of Quincy, that road goes in and out of Aurora, in and out of unincorporated Arapahoe County. So it is two different directions. I will say that we work really well with the of Aurora on projects. They're participating in the current construction going on at Gun Club in Quincy. Um, and that's a very large project. You'll be able to see a lot of difference in that um, intersection after it's completed uh, next year sometime. Um, actually, I think they're, they're hoping to get it done um, early next year. But, you know, with weather, COVID, we don't know how these projects are going to end up. So uh, again, north of Quincy, it's State Highway 30. It's their responsibility. It's on their plan to widen, uh, but it's not on a five-year plan or a 10-year plan. So um, I believe that Arapo County would consider taking the responsibility for that 
um, maintenance of that road if the state would bring it up to the county standards by adding one more lane uh, northbound and one more lane southbound. So increasing it to two lanes and then we would take it over from the state if they were willing to give it up. Uh, I don't believe they're willing to do that at this point. South of Quincy, again, we have plans in Arapahoe County in conjunction with Aurora to, um, because it's wide in certain areas and it narrows down and bottlenecks in other areas. It goes from, from two lanes down to one lane in two different locations between Quincy and the Southlands Shopping Center or Smoky Hill Road. So we do have plans for that to be widened uh, within um, probably about 10 years. Um, and it uh, is all dependent upon funding that we receive, both the city and the county, that we can contribute towards that. The intersection of Gun Club and Quincy has been federalized, which means that we're receiving federal funds, um, but we had to meet the match of at least 50% between us and Aurora. So I hope it, that answers your question. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, next one is for Director Carter about the fairgrounds. Um, obviously, the the annual fair is the biggest event of the year. Um, but with COVID, you know, still in effect, uh, I believe the alternate care facility is still at least partially constructed out at the fairgrounds. I'm wondering how you are evaluating upcoming events and and when and whether you might have to either adjust them or cancel them or push them to a later date. Good question. And what we are hosting certain events, uh, for example, we had the um, uh, cross country track with uh, uh, Aurora Public Schools out there with about a week or so ago. And we are having a number of different outdoor events. I believe one of the uh, questions was the pictures on the planes, which we had uh, two nights of those or earlier this month. And as I mentioned earlier, we're looking at hosting a number of other events throughout the fall and uh, early uh, spring, uh, in fall, winter, and early spring of next year. As far as renting the event, um, we're in the process of really working with those who have reservations, because as you can imagine, the uh, event center was booked out uh, for the, the bulk of the year, and a number of events had to either be rescheduled or canceled altogether. And so we're in the process of working with the individuals and groups that have already made reservations to see whether we can accommodate them um, under the restrictions of, I think we can only have like 175 people uh, at the uh, location at, at this particular point. So under the state uh, mandated orders, uh, that's the limit of the number of people that can attend these events. But we are working with them. We are having certain events. Uh, we had a uh, uh, car rally, uh, I believe about a week or so ago. Uh, we've had a number of different outdoor events at the um, covered arena. And so we're still having activities and events out at the fair or yeah, out at the fairgrounds. And we plan to have uh, more. And as these uh, public health orders are lifted or modified, we'll be looking at adding more events and activities out there. Excellent, thank you. Um, Commissioner Baker, you recently played a, a significant role in this, helping establish uh, the veteran service office position. Can you talk a little bit about how that came together and what it's gonna sure. mean to the county? Definitely, talking about government moving slowly, um, especially when it comes to money and personnel uh, FTEs, full-time equivalents, full-time employees, very difficult when your budget is constrained. So we look at ways to leverage funding from different sources. Commissioner Holan and I um, are both veterans and we felt strongly that our veteran services office, which is based in um, Littleton, is where their office is. We have two. We have um, two different veteran services officers serving the veteran service office in Littleton. Now they go different places. They've gone out to the American Legion in Byers. They've gone out to the VFW in Strasburg. They go a lot of different places to provide their services 
to our veterans, something near and dear to both Commissioner Holan and I. We saw a need because of the new veterans hospital in Aurora that I want to first give thanks to Ed Perlmutter and to uh, Mike Kaufman, um, who when they were in, when Mike was a congressman and, and, and Ed Perlmutter is a congressman now, did a lot to bring this VA medical center to fruition. And we need to continue the support. We have veterans from all over the region, from Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, uh, New Mexico, Utah, Kansas, coming to this hospital to receive medical treatment. And they needed to have a way to um, apply for their benefits while they're being treated at that VA medical center. So there was a great need. We partnered with Adams County and the city of Aurora to fund, uh, well, um, Adams County and Arapaho County are going to uh, cooperate to fund one additional FTE who will be based in an office in uh, Aurora. Aurora will be providing um, additional in-kind uh, support for this veteran service office at 14th and Chambers in a county owned building initially. This is a one year pilot to see how much use is given or is directed towards how much service they provide, how many veterans are seeking services at that location, but it will be very easy for them to, tra to travel between that office and the veterans hospital to provide services to our veterans. That's great. And we're, we're gonna begin the hiring process next month, I believe, correct? Correct. Okay, great. And now another decision that uh, the board recently made was with regards to uh, medical and recreational marijuana in unincorporated parts of the county. Can you talk about what happened there? Sure. Um, Arapo County historically has had four medical marijuana establishments. Um, they're mostly in the urban part in fact, they're all in the urban part. I believe one is in a district one and three are in district four. And these medical marijuana uh, locations have been operating for, I believe, close to 20 years, if not over 20 years. And they've had no violations uh, from the state for uh, selling uh, medical marijuana to people that are unauthorized. There have been no reports of robberies. There have been no reports of illicit activity going on in the vicinity. These businesses have been operating um, flawlessly, to put it bluntly, for a long time. And they asked if the Board of County Commissioners would consider allowing them to transition from medical marijuana only to retail marijuana. Uh, including retail marijuana, keep their medical marijuana role, but also open up retail marijuana. Now, the fact is, is that many of these four establishments are um, close to jurisdictions that already have marijuana, retail marijuana establishments in their jurisdiction. They're close to Denver. They're close to um, Englewood. They're close to uh, I'm not sure if Englewood has retail marijuana. I'm not saying they do, but retail marijuana is available. And these businessmen uh, made a case that Arapahoe County was leaving the possibility of taxing retail marijuana on the table. If we had to look in every seat cushion underneath every seat cushion in the washer and dryer for any money that we could possibly find to try to balance our budget. This was low hanging fruit as far as I was concerned. And the board, it wasn't a, a unanimous decision, uh, but there were uh, three, uh, three um, 
commissioners that agreed to allow those uh, medical marijuana shops to transition to retail. And so uh, they've been granted an opportunity to apply. It, they're not guaranteed to become retail marijuana. They have to follow the state guidelines. They have to follow the sheriff's guidelines. They have to follow all of the business guidelines for retail marijuana in order to open up. I don't know if any of them have actually applied yet, but they now have that opportunity. We have not expanded retail um, to anyone else in Arapahoe County. Uh, other than those that operate because they're in, in a city that allows that. Right. Great. Um, and you, you know, you mentioned the revenue components of that, uh, as it pertains to the County. Um, we have time for about one more question. I think, uh, I'm going to ask you, you know, we've heard a lot about COVID that's obviously thrown a wrench into all of our plans this year. And that means everyone. Um, and it has financial implications for us. So um, in addition to what the obvious uh, financial limitations might be going forward, um, what, do you, what do you think are the biggest challenges uh, for the county and how optimistic are you about our ability to address them? Thank you, Luke. You know, when COVID struck in March, uh, I went out on a limb and I said, you know what? And I talked at the beginning of this town hall about our budget and about how we have a small um, surplus. Um, we always want to have that surplus for a rainy day. COVID was a rainy day. And I believed that we were going to have to dip into those that surplus, that rainy day savings account that we maintain in order to get through this crisis. And we would have had to if we hadn't got those CARES funding from the federal government of $114.5 million. There's no doubt in my mind that we would have probably made a big dent into that surplus. So for the federal government that came through for us and provided, and we were able to pass it on to the communities, the cities, the towns, the communities in Arapahoe County, we're very grateful because without that funding, we would be a lot worse than we are now. Uh, look, we're like I said, we're gonna have to tighten our belts. That's the hard decisions, those are the things. That means we're gonna have to prioritize what projects go forward, what projects don't, what projects are permanently uh, eliminated or delayed. Uh, if it's important enough and it has a safety connotation, then it will be prioritized. If it affects, um, um, our citizens, then we'll definitely look at everything. Uh, we've been receiving a lot of emails. Now, now most of these emails are um, form emails that we know someone is asking them to send to us. And the topic says, don't defund the police. Um, it, it's obviously they're not familiar with the county because they wouldn't say don't defund the police. They would say don't defund the sheriff's office. And the way I've been responding to those folks is that, you know, the Rapa County Board of Commissioners have not discussed any plans to defund the sheriff's office, to defund the jail, to defund our public safety requirements and responsibilities. Um, but given the COVID crisis, if we cut the budget anywhere, in our belt tightening process, the sheriff's office may be one of those offices that's affected, along with the clerk and recorder's office, the assessor's office, the treasurer, and all of our departments from facilities and fleet management to public works to human resources across the board. We may need to tighten our belts. Um, but that would be the reason why, is for budgetary concerns, not because we believe that our sheriff's office has done anything wrong or uh, that any of our sheriffs, um, we all know there, I, I wanna say this is, we all know that there are stories of people abusing power. And I don't care whether you wear a gun or a badge or you wear an emblem um, from the county, uh, if you have authority and you abuse that authority, you need to be punished for that. You need to um, be um, prosecuted if it's a criminal case. 
if you deprive someone of their civil liberties, if you provide, if you de deprive someone of their right to um, uh, enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness here in the United States, then you need to be um, held accountable for that. But I do believe that the vast majority of our um, sheriffs, deputies, of our police officers that are patrolling our communities, our folks, I'm, I came from that environment and they come to work every day trying to be a service to the citizens. They're hopeful that they won't be hurt or killed. They wanna return home to their families like everyone else. And they do a marvelous job um, the majority of the time. So again, I will hold people responsible for their actions. <clears throat> I got passionate, sorry. Hope that answers that question, Lou. That's great. That's a great note to end on. Um, thank you, Commissioner Baker, and thank you, Director Carter. Uh, and thanks to all of you. Um, the, a recording of this event will be available on arapahogov.com within about 24 hours, maybe less. And I, I would encourage you all to join us for the next two, which are the next two Thursdays, also at 7 p.m. Uh, on Thursday the 3rd, we have Commissioner Nancy Sharp from District 2. She'll be joined by our Human Services Department Director, Cheryl Turnus. And then on uh, Thursday, September 10th, also at 7 p.m., we'll have District 1's Kathleen Conti, Commissioner Kathleen Conti, joined by uh, Brian Weimer from Public Works and Development. So thank you all for joining us and have a great evening.